All right, uh, while well, the rest of the attendees uh, enter the room, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, today we're going to be discussing infrastructure funding with an asset management or capital improvement plan. Um, we'd like to thank the Water Resource Center. Um, the Water Resource Center of the Southwestern Pennsylvania Commission is dedicated to promoting regional collaboration on water topics, facilitating coordination and education, and providing technical assistance to its members' governments. Uh, WRC provides support to federal, state, regional, and local organizations, counties, cities, and municipalities on various water resource management initiatives. The WRC does continue to provide educational programs to the region, and if you have any ideas for needed training, please contact them at wpcwater.org. Um, again, today's topic is going to be infrastructure funding with an asset management or capital improvement plan. Uh, today's presenters will be Ben Gilberti and Rob Arnold of HRG. Um, as a reminder, we will be using the question and answer um, box here on Zoom, so please submit your questions um, to that function throughout the webinar, and then we'll address those at the end. And also as a friendly reminder, this will be a recorded webinar um, and it will be available on the SPC website um, at the conclusion of it. And uh, with all of that said, I'd like to pass this over to Ben Gilberti. All right, uh, thank you everybody uh, for joining us this day after Labor Day. I'm sure everyone's, uh, if you're like me, trying to figure out how to uh, do your work day and the first day of school. So uh, I feel for those that are doing that as well. It's been a challenge, but uh, glad to get it moving. Uh, again, my name is Ben Gilberti. I am the group manager of HRG Civil Group out of the Pittsburgh office. Also with me is Rob Arnold. Rob is a senior project manager uh, and team lead with the HRG Pittsburgh Civil Group as well. So uh, today we're gonna talk to you a little bit about asset management and capital improvement planning and how that's going to help fund some of your projects. Uh, I think everybody is aware, you know, there's no shortage of needs, but there always seems to be a shortage of money and uh, grants are more competitive. No one likes higher taxes or, or utility rates, yet things need to get fixed. And, you know, what we're hoping to cover today may help some folks with those issues. So what we intend to cover, you know, what is uh, asset management, what is a capital improvement plan, how do these plans help me with funding my needs, and how do I get started in doing both of these issues or both of these plans. So, you know, first thing, you know, what is asset management? Um, you know, getting into it, we all know the problem. Um, we see a lot of short-term decisions on uh, long-term investments. We kind of look at today and don't always look um, what that decision today will lead to, to uh, for tomorrow. A lot of times we see underfunding of maintenance uh, and replacements, uh, you know, it, it's fine. We'll get another year out of it. You know, what is the impact of that level of thinking? And with using um, asset management and capital improvement plan, um, the hope is we're managing those assets and that capital better uh, so we don't have that large cost at the end to fix it once it's broken um, or we're getting more life out of it, you know, getting more value for our dollar. And if we have a good calculated reserve and funding, we have revenue stability so we're not always scratching to, to find that extra money that we need. We're not trying to take from one fund and to, to solve a problem somewhere else only to cause a problem somewhere else. So that, that's the long-term goal. Again, why manage these assets? Um, from a municipal standpoint, from a, um, you know, uh, municipalities, authorities, from that view of asset management, they're, they're major investment, whether it be public or private. You know, our clients, we typically see their projects that are designed and constructed by the owner, which is usually a, a public entity. Or sometimes we see assets that are um, converted over, um, dedicated uh, to a municipality. Think land development plans, subdivision plans, that every time those get built out, uh, there is a new, um, a new 
road, a new stormwater system, a new sanitary system that gets added. Uh, next, an increased knowledge of our system allows for better financial decisions. So we'll be able to, uh, if we understand what our system is, what our, our assets are, we can better understand how our decisions impact them. We can look for efficient and cost-effective operations. So as we're, we're spending that tax dollar, we're spending that, that capital fund money, we're making sure we're getting the most bang for our buck. We're making sure we're not in a situation where you know, a classic one is we repave a road only to find out that there's a sewer break or a stormwater break underneath and end up digging it again. Um, if we knew that ahead of time, we could have fixed it maybe from the bottom up and make sure that any improvements we do have a lasting effect. Again, uh, a lot of these assets are infrastructure based. They don't have to be, but um, they have us, they're, they're essential to public health and safety. Everyone needs them. Uh, if you know anyone's experiencing an internet outage today, uh, it's critical to the success of not only this presentation, but uh, education as well as business operations. So, you know, that, that is critical. Um, access to financial assistance. Um, by having a good capital improvement plan, we know what our needs are, we know what the next step is, and we can try to look for money to uh, continue to manage and grow those, those systems. And we're trying to look for a system that is reliable, resilient, and sustainable because the cost to replace, you know, a storm pipe or a, a sanitary main uh, is very large. And uh, if we can maintain them and make them last as long as possible, if not indefinitely, everybody wins. So uh, what are typically considered assets? Um, an asset is something of use or value. Again, in the municipal world, generally including um, visible infrastructure and um, underground infrastructure. So your visible infrastructure. Uh, that is, you know, the most common one would be roads. Uh, you could get into park equipment. Uh, you could get into uh, actual public works equipment, whether it be a truck or an excavator it could be a swimming pool. Uh, it, it really is broad uh, as you want to make it, but that's kind of what we have. They're, they're in front of you, they're visible. The other ones, uh, other assets are less visible. That's more your underground infrastructure. That's your pipe networks, whether it be sewer or storm. Uh, it could also be water lines. It's things that you can't see all the time. Um, both of these um, types of assets have a life cycle. So, you know, they're brand new when they start, and at some point um, the, their life cycle will uh, end. So each, you know, that applies to both the visible and underground assets. <clears throat> so again, covered this um, a little bit there, visible assets, very broad, um, your roads, your buildings. Um, the, the key takeaway here is these assets are a little easier to assess because you can see them, you can touch them, um, other people can see them, you know, you can look at their condition uh, very easily. Here's some pictures of some non-visible uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, the takeaway here is they're not always visible. They're very easy to neglect because no one sees them. And to top it all off, uh, they're typically depending on their age may not be good records or mapping of where these these where this infrastructure even is you know looking at uh the bottom picture there with the water line the day before that picture was taken i'm sure everyone thought that water line was fine the next day it's not fine uh chances are it wasn't fine forever something caused that um but again out of sight out of mind same with the middle picture there with the stormwater pipe it rains, water flows, there's no issue until for some reason we ran a camera through it. And yeah, that there's uh, that pipe's almost fully collapsed and it could be a major issue. So again, out of sight, out of mind. So here's a kind of a, just a general graph to kind of reinforce the life cycle. Um, this is just a, a pipe graph that 
you know, the condition early on, uh, brand new pipe is excellent. As we start sliding out uh, the timeline there, uh, every 10 years, it starts to fall. And then once we get around the 50 year um, lifespan without any maintenance, it really tails off in a hurry. And if the pipe is, you know, at the end of its lifespan, the condition really deteriorates quickly. So here's another, you know, visual that helps reinforce this of just kind of the condition of pipe networks from 1980 to 2000 to today. You can really see the amount of excellent infrastructure out there is about a 33% compared to 69% in 1980. Uh, the, the pipes aren't getting better. The condition is getting worse. Our infrastructure is aging. <clears throat> Here's another graph. This one's more for a road. Uh, again, roads are a little bit different. They tend to hold their design life a little bit even uh, as time goes on. But again, once they start to, to go down, they really, really degrade quickly. And the cost to get it back up to a good satisfactory condition really increases. You know, while it's at a fair, you know, we're, we're spending a dollar to rehabilitate it, but once it's really down there in a serious or failed condition, we're at the six to $10 um, investment. So we're almost 10 times a repair cost than we are a, re a rehabilitation. So what are the, you know, the simple steps towards asset management? And again, the, there's no, um, hard and, and fast guideline. It, it's, you know, each asset can be looked at differently. Each asset, you know, depending on if it's a truck or a road or a pipe needs to be looked at differently. However, here are the basics to put together a basic asset management plan. You need to identify your assets, age, and your cost and rate the condition of each of those assets. <clears throat> so asset, um, identifying the assets and age. Determine the location of the assets. Again, here's where the visual ones are, are very easy because you can see them. Um, if you can have a GIS or can utilize the GIS effort to manage this, uh, very helpful. You can keep a lot of data with it. It's very visual, um, but again, not necessary. Um, you can separate each asset into appropriate plans. So, you know, to have an overall asset management plan may become a little uh, intimidating depending on how much you're trying to include. So, you know, what does this look like? It could include uh, a roadway management plan, a stormwater management plan, an equipment management plan, you know, break them out to like, uh, like assets is gonna be very beneficial. Try to get any historical records or knowledge that might be available. Um, historical and, and long-term public works staff have a lot of the knowledge that may be beneficial where good records aren't kept. And if you have any historical mapping, that could at least help with the location uh, and maybe even size uh, and, and type material of the asset that you're looking at, which again, helps fill in the blanks. Costs. You know, it's really easy to figure out what a plow truck cost uh, when we bought it or a new pickup truck costs. Uh, we may not know what that brick street that was built in the 1930s cost, but um, again, try to assign a cost that the uh, original purchase would be. This may also include a replacement cost just to kind of get a baseline. If you have historical bidding information, that's great. Um, but the key here is don't forget operation and maintenance costs. A lot of times with infrastructure, everyone just thinks what's it take to repair it and we're done, but there is a cost to maintain it. So what is the cost to um, clean out inlets, the cost to change the oil in a piece of equipment, the cost to um, pave a road or sweep a road, um, all of that adds up. And that is all a part of the maintenance uh, that will come into the cost later when you develop your capital improvement plan. Rate the condition of each asset. And again, there's different ways out there that for each you know, specific type of infrastructure, pavement and roadways have PASER or pavement condition index, two similar um, standardized uh, condition the, across the industry. 
Pipelines have the NASCO rating criteria, again, a standardized across the, the industry. However, you know, you can develop your own condition assessment as long as you're, con you're consistent and um, clear as to what each rating means. So a couple examples. Here's a, a road uh, breakdown as to what a pavement condition index looks like for a good road all the way to a failed road. Again, this is standard and it has how to guide um, guidance as to how to rate each road. So, you know, I may look at a road and consider it um, satisfactory. Rob may go out and look at it and see something that he considers it's fair, but at the end of the day, we're assigning a number to it and trying to take that human element out as much as possible. Here's an example of a generic um, very simple condition index. And this could be on a piece of equipment. This could be, you know, a pump at a wastewater treatment plant. You know, hey, it's brand new. We put it in last year. It's a five. Um, it broke. It doesn't do anything anymore. And we can't get parts for it. That's clearly a one. And we just kind of either use maintenance records or our operator's opinion as to, you know, where it falls in between. Uh, and it could just be you know, the, the sales uh, rep telling us that the, the pumps typically last 10 years and ours is eight years old, uh, we should probably be down towards the two or the three and not up towards the five. <clears throat> the next step, um, trying to determine that expected useful life of each asset and evaluate the risk exposure. So a couple factors to look at when we're looking at the useful life age and material of the system. Um, in the sanitary world, you know, we're dealing with a lot of uh, clay pipe in and around the Pittsburgh area. It, it is still operating, um, but it is nearing the end of its useful life. Uh, we know that based on clay pipe. We know that based on condition uh, assessment, you know, we, we can try to put it uh, an idea of where that usefulness is, you know. Um, back to the municipal plow truck, uh, sees a lot of corrosive materials and the salt on the roads, sees a lot of use. Uh, it's not going to have the same, the same lifespan as a, uh, a, a dump truck just used in construction that's not used for salt. So there's some impacts there. Uh, one of the other things to look at for asset is kind of current and future capacity of the system. Uh, not many people look at this, but from a sanitary standpoint, if there's going to be future development, um, think sewers that are going to have increased flow and the pipe just isn't big enough, the pipe may be fine, but the lifespan isn't, isn't going to allow it to have the capacity to deal with all that increased uh, sanitary need. So um, while the condition may be good, the life may be shorter just based on capacity. Uh, roads could be another one. If you know the, the road system needs expanded, um, the road may be in good shape, but it's just not big enough to handle the, the need, uh, the life could be shortened. Um, and again, type of use, I think we've covered, depending on um, how the equipment is being used, where it is being used, which kind of ties into the environmental standpoint. A uh, ductile iron pipe in a corrosive soil condition won't last as long as a ductile iron pipe in a non-corrosive soil condition. So all of these things as available can really help with uh, determining the useful life of your asset. And then uh, the fun slide as to what's our risk exposure or is there any redundancy? You know, if, if we have to close this road or shut off this water line, is there ways to still service, um, provide the service without it? Can we, you know, put in a detour? Can we close some valves and still maintain service? What's that risk? Again, the age of the asset. If we know things are very old uh, and are not going to be able to, to hold up much longer, probably need to be closer to getting maintenance or repair than one that is newer. And then what's the consequence of failure? And I, you know, everyone in Pittsburgh probably gets a chuckle out of this picture, but that was a roadway failure and um, among other things, but that road was closed for 
uh, weeks uh, that having impact as to, you know, the bus fell into the road, the road had to be closed, equipment had to be brought in, obviously the bus didn't work. Um, you know, what is that risk that if this critical part fails that we need to come in and bring in emergency services, we need an emergency loop, um, all things are going to cost money and no one wants to deal with if they can avoid them. So I think the takeaway is our goal is preservation um, versus rehabilitation. So this is, you know, kind of a, a back to those other graphs, the life cycle graphs that I referenced before, you know, eventually everything fails, but with proper maintenance, we bring that condition up. And the idea is instead of it failing, we're, we're moving that design life out further and further and further. So um, applying the right treatment at the right time allows this to happen. So that that's by having a good asset management plan, you can start moving more towards the, the rehabilitation and preservation part where we're not replacing a whole a whole roadway from the ground up, we're just doing uh, crack sealing or a light overlay or a microsurface to keep that condition as good as possible and invest smaller amounts of money in, um, over shorter time periods versus the giant amount of money at the end. And then, you know, kind of the last step of asset management here is develop your renewal strategies. They may include uh, increased maintenance and monitoring, changing the way you're operating equipment, look at actually just doing a repair if you need to. Are there opportunities to refurbish and rehabilitate? So we see a lot of uh, those clay sanitary pipes that I mentioned before. You know, if we can go in before they collapse, we can put in a, a liner. We don't have to dig the road up. We don't have to really interrupt service. Um, we've basically had a brand new pipe by using the old pipe, um, much cheaper than a full replacement, much longer lifespan. Um, it, it helps that asset last longer. Um, there may be better technology out there uh, that we want to utilize. The corrugated metal storm pipe, you know, we may want to be looking at a plastic pipe. It, it's going to last longer. And in some assets, um, there might not be a clear option or answer. So those ones may need uh, a more formal study, a, a, a more in-depth look at how to fix them. But by having a good asset management plan, you're only focusing that effort on the ones that you need it, not the entire system. So uh, I'm gonna transition to Rob here of how do you take this asset management plan and, and develop a capital improvement plan? Okay, thanks, Ben. And uh, one thing we all, <laughs> one thing we all realize in the uh, in, in this year that we're having is that doing programs like this, this is typically a time where we would switch positions, and you could switch positions, and I'd have a chance to look you in the eye and, and uh, even start with uh, you know cracking some kind of joke. But we're not we're not there right now. So take a breath. Um, give Ben a chance to take a breath. But what I'm going to talk about now is so far we've uh, been talking about maybe individual assets or grouping of assets. And moving forward into a capital improvement plan, you're, you're kind of um, coordinating all of that information and developing maybe a three, four, five, ten year plan, depending on what you're comfortable with and what information that you have to allow for everything that Ben has just been talking about. Sorry, well, no, no formula is right for all systems. Um, but you, as you go through the steps that Ben just discussed, you come down to the estimate the required expense and determine the year for renewal, we combine them all into the capital improvement plan. And the old saying is, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail because eventually something will happen. Uh, ben mentioned, you know, the, like the underground utilities, they tend to be the least sexy until something goes wrong. Well, it, it'd be, it's much better to avoid that water line break or that sewer collapse or the storm sewer collapse as much as possible and get out ahead of them with, with uh, investigations and repairs. So while there's a, lot of, there's a lot of words on this slide, I know, but basically, you know, proper planning gives you that basis uh, to maintain the facilities and or plan for their replacement. As we know, especially right now, as we're all entering the, you know, our, our annual budget process, you know, sometimes needed repairs are deferred because 
Uh, and now we may be looking at two or three years out as opposed to just looking at next year. Just the money's, money may not be there or you're gonna have a grant application or some sub, uh, subsidized funding. So you're gonna put something off. Well, that's also going to result in probably uh, that repair or replacement costing more in the future. That type of information has to be brought forward into your capital improvement plan. Information and communication are the keys. And that just doesn't mean between the uh, municipal manager and the engineer or the municipal manager and public works director. Uh, as we get through to the later slides, I really recommend getting everybody involved because they have to understand that, yes, we're not just doing next year's budget. We're trying to plan things out to proactively uh, address our issues. Once again, you need to assess the current condition of your infrastructure, look at ways to avoid the uh, failures or the emergencies, um, and ways to talk internally. And sometimes those, talk, those discussions haven't, haven't been uh, a usual thing. Um, but I think, especially today, uh, I really recommend that they, that they become a more usual thing. Ben had the, con, uh, the cartoon about the path of least resistance. Um, it's always about money in, money out. Uh, part of the capital improvement planning approach will help us help you and help your organization lead to, uh, okay, how are, we, how are we gonna fund these improvements? How are we going to make sure we can complete these and uh, not have to defer too much, too much action on our long-term investments? Ben touched on service lives, below ground, increased cost from waiting. These often result in uh, putting off what you need to do now. It's understandable, money's tight, but you should plan for when that can happen. So the basic benefits of capital improvement planning defines the scales of the needs. And you know, up to now, we've kind of been talking about individual assets. Once again, we're grouping groupings of assets uh, or like assets, if you will. Um, but starting a capital improvement plan means sitting down and, and bringing all of that together. Your underground assets, your above ground assets, your, your mechanical needs, your parks and, parks and uh, other facilities, recreation facilities. Um, putting that together in a cohesive plan so that you know you have to continue to fund these, maintain them, operate them, potentially replace portions of them going forward. And, and that involves coordinating that, all of that information into one plan. Capital improvement planning can provide the link between planning documents. And what we, need, what we mean there is typically, there will have been a comprehensive plan, uh, maybe a sewer system evaluation survey if you've been around for a while. Um, some type of planning document that has looked at various aspects of your facilities and either talked about um, current conditions, talked about potential uses, as Ben mentioned, talked about where there may be new development or where there, where there may be need for new facilities, redoing parks, uh, once again, uh, um, purchasing new equipment. If you happen to have a water and wastewater treatment system, that you, know, you, have, a, you have a significant investment there. So it provides the link between everything that's in planning, those reports that may have been sitting on a shelf, hopefully not, and uh, you're planning for the next three, four, five, ten 10 years. Same thing, allowing for the systematic uh, evaluation of those projects, allows you to pri prioritize them too, because you may uh, individually look at, okay, here's what we have to do on the water system, here's, how if we, here's what we have to do for wastewater, here are the roads. We can prioritize those each individually, but when we lump them all together and see what we entirely have to budget for, um, we're going to have to prioritize some projects. We're going to prioritize some scheduling. When are we going to be able to complete uh, some of these activities? And, and I think, and this isn't just me as an engineer saying this because I've, I've worked with communities that do it all in-house, taking the time to sit down and do this will eventually pay for itself because you will be able to prioritize funding. You'll be able to prioritize scheduling. You're going to know when things are happening. Uh, we know that some funding agencies actually look for capital improvement plans to see that you've looked down the line and maybe even schedule their grants. So eventually the, the time and, and resources, whether internal or external, that are, are taken now will uh, really benefit everybody in the end. Some of this is uh, repeating uh, once again, because um, while we've been considering the assets individually, we have to age, uh, condition, ability to meet all the current future, not only capacity, but regulations. 
you know, those of us in the MS4 world are just waiting for the next permit. So how are we going to deal with that coming down the line? Uh, those of us in Allegheny County are going to be facing new, um, potentially new consent orders soon. Um, they're, they're, the ability to plan for changes, even when you don't know exactly what those changes will be, is very important. Compile a project listing. Um, you come in with the, the uh, scopes and costs that Ben discussed, prioritize and schedule, um, establishing your overall magnitude of need. That, that's another thing that sitting down and doing capital improvement planning can do. As you deal with each individual asset or each individual system, there's going to be a pot of money there that, oh, you know, we have to spend this on water, this on sewer, this on roads. Sometimes um, it's, not, uh, it's not usual to sit down and lump those all together, especially, except for maybe municipal managers. But that's the type of information that I think is important to get in front of elected officials, appointed officials, uh, the groupings in your communities that may be working on your parks or maybe public works committees. That's the type of stuff that everybody needs to see because, you know, sometimes information <clears throat> can get a little pigeonholed. That also allows you to develop your financing strategy. You can start looking at things like, okay, we, with current or and expected revenues, we can afford to do this this year. Maybe we apply for a couple of grants and pending those grants, we can do that next year. Maybe we'll need some additional grants for matching funds, or maybe we just need to go out and, and obtain some kind of financing. <clears throat> that helps you develop that strategy to, to look uh, not only with the physical portions of the projects, but the financial portion of the projects going, going into the future. So um, to the next part of the presentation, you know, we, we spoke a lot about asset management. We spoke a lot about capital improvement planning, uh, but it's not real clear still how they help us get, get funding. Uh, and the next part of the presentation here is just going to cover, you know, how do you use these things to, to actually get projects uh, completed? So again, the de developing the finance, funding strategy that Rob had talked about is the, the key goal here. We're, we want to understand where we're spending our money, when we're spending our money, and why we're spending our money. So these, you know, the capital improvement plan and the asset management plan, you know, help us develop that strategy. Again, you know, the budgets, um, being able to synchronize your capital and operating budgets um, is, is huge, especially right now we're moving into budget season. Um, we're able to use data to evaluate competing demands for resources. You know, everybody, um, you know, around the budget table has their pet project. Um, there's no shortage of needs. There's always a shortage of funds. How do we make sure that the decisions we make move our communities in a positive direction and we're gaining ground on our aging infrastructure versus continuing to defer maintenance and, and losing ground. Again, uh, these plants help prioritize the long-term goals and objectives of the community. So where do we want to be in 10, 20 years? What's the condition? Do we want you know, our roads to be all brand new? Do we want them all to be at a certain level? Uh, we need to get some of them open because they're in such a bad situation that um, they're, they're currently impassable and in 10 years would like to, you know, open two roads and not lose the condition of the other ones. Um, by uh, doing this plan, you can identify and optimize the financing of capital projects. So kind of that consistency uh, across the board and, and making good decisions and not, not spending money on emergency repairs. Uh, we make sure projects aren't forgotten as, as their staffing changes, as there's board changes. Um, you know, these political changes are kind of mitigated that, you know, oh yeah, that pipe that was half collapsed that we knew we had to get to, uh, everyone on council changed, we got a new manager and a new public works person, we forgot all about it. Uh, it it's now written in a plan uh, to understand why that's needed. I think one of the undervalued um, portions of capital improvement plan is gaining support. And it's not only support of the community, uh, you know, the staff and the municipal community, but also the, the community as a whole. Um, I think it, it helps show um, fiscal responsibility 
it helps build political support for a project and it, it allows for accountability. You know, uh, I've been in meetings, we've all been in meetings where, you know, the public shows up and wants to know why are we getting a tax increase? What, why are we paving that road? It's just because so-and-so's cousin lives there. It's not because it's in a bad condition. You know, these plans help show that, nope, we're planned out the um here is the reason that road's getting it versus your road and uh look this is the most efficient use of our money um I, you know i have a, a colleague that i work with that when the the politics got crazy uh the answer was always just give them facts you, you can't argue the facts to death you may still not agree but at least with the factual information to back you up you have a reason for why we're we're going the way we are and, and these plans help with that and by making the community a stakeholder in the process, you know, you're going to get that support and move together um, as one, one group, hopefully. So the first way that capital improvement plans um, help you get money is use the money you already have. Um, by using your money efficiently, you're going to get more bang for that, that buck. And instead of having to reconstruct that road, or dig that pipe up, uh, we're gonna try to maintain it and do it at a time when it makes sense. Uh, we're gonna tr try to get ahead of that life cycle curve nosedive uh, where you know we just can't, can't keep the condition where we need it and, and it just keeps getting expensive. And we're gonna do that maintenance at the right time with the right solution because uh, having to do the rehabilitation, it, it takes a lot more money and then indecision um, delays and increased costs. So, you know, the area that, that Rob and I probably see this the most is um, folks that wanna pave their road but can't figure out which road they're gonna pave and then the bids hit the streets in August when all the pavers already have their full workload. If you have a good plan, you can put next year's, we could be bidding 2021 roads uh, November, December, January, when everyone's looking for work, get a more competitive price, um, more uh, bidders out there. That's a more efficient use of taxpayer money. Uh, future revenues, you know, no one likes to raise taxes or rates. Um, but by doing a good capital improvement plan, including your operation and maintenance costs, uh, having a good timeline of how we're going to fund this, you have a pretty accurate picture of what's it going to take to get these jobs done. And, and these plans are living documents. They're going to change, but it's at least a guideline um, of how we're going to budget. And, you know, the only thing worse than the tax increase is um, having to do two tax increases because you guessed the number wrong. Uh, you know, no one likes it. We've had clients where the public comes in for a sewer rate increase and they don't understand it. And then once you start showing the need and the plan and the thought behind it, it was like, oh, well, that makes sense. I'm not as angry. Does it work for everybody? Absolutely not. But, you know, it, it at least helps justify what you're trying to do. Uh, also, uh, trying to mitigate the need for a large emergency uh, inflow of cash um, by keeping your infrastructure in good shape. Uh, we're hopefully not going to have that catastrophic failure where we're going to have to go out and, and borrow money or, or really, you know, cut programs to pay for it. And, you know, uh, as of right now, uh, you know, low interest rates out in the market is now a good time to maybe borrow some money to get ahead. Uh, it depends on each community. But for some communities, this may be an opportunity to really move up the plan. But if you don't have the plan, you know, it, it's just very difficult to make that decision. Again, also by having these plans, I think it allows you to find some efficiencies that maybe can have someone else's dollars be used to improve your community. Uh, coordinate with other work. I had mentioned before that, you know, the, the whole, we cut the brand new pavement because we didn't know the pipe was bad underneath or we didn't think about it. Trying to combine those two together, that's, you know, potentially one contractor, one engineering design, uh, one bid documents, maybe a larger 
contract that, that gets more contractors involved uh, impacts our community just once instead of three times uh, over three years. All, all things that, that move the needle in a positive direction. Uh, it's easier to do utility coordination if uh, you have a pavement management plan um, that you can go to the gas company and say, hey, we are looking to pave these two roads uh, in the next three years. And they come back and say, well, we are looking to replace our, our gas lines in the next two years or in the next five years. Maybe we make an adjustment to the plan and go pave somewhere else because uh, they're gonna dig it up and maybe be able to contribute to the, the restoration effort there. And uh, private investment and development. If you know you have an undersized system, you know, the sanitary example I had mentioned in the a previous slide, um, you know, housing development's coming in. Hey, we just don't have the capacity. Here's what's gonna cost to upgrade that. Is there some way we can do a cost share uh, or work together and again, that's, you know, it may not get it for you for free, but it's not a 100% uh, municipal paid either. And then grant funding, you know, the, the world's, the municipal world still revolves around grant funding. Uh, I think the biggest benefits for capital improvement plan in the grant world is it allows you to leverage budgeted funds uh, so uh, hopefully, if you know you're you're looking to do a large capital improvement a couple years out, you're in a position to at least be saving some money and use that money as a match. Uh, it allows you to have some accurate project cost estimates. So when you're chasing grants, you're not uh, starting from scratch every time. You at least have a, a ballpark of what these projects cost, which allows you to match it to the right grant funding. You know, if you're you're chasing roadway grants with a water line project, that's probably not going to work. But if we're going to replace a water line as part of a, a streetscape upgrade, then maybe all of a sudden now that does work. So you're you're putting yourself in a better position to get get funding, but still solving two problems with with one project. And again, by having your projects kind of timed out in, in, in a list, that's going to allow you to um, make sure you don't miss grants. You're going to be ahead of the curve instead of trying to scramble to get it in at the last minute. You're going to kind of have a timeline of what you want to uh, chase at what time. And again, um, by having that timeline and that community support, that's going to allow you to get funding letters and whatever else you would need, political support, um, other agency coordination, that, that's all done ahead of time. So at this point, I'll, I'll pass it over to Rob because I know that, you know, a lot of information, a lot of size, and you might be wondering, you know, where do I start? The, the, how, what do I need to do to even get started with this? So Rob, help them get started. <laughs> Just pull the chain, that's all. Yeah. Uh, no, because, because as, we, as we discuss these, these concepts, it's easy to get, or it can be easy to be overwhelmed because you, you are eventually or potentially uh, you know dealing with a lot of information some of which you may have not have dealt with in this manner before uh, and it's oh my gosh I'm never going to be able to do that but but you can take uh, baby steps if you will and you can take some very cost effective steps as opposed to oh my gosh I don't know how to use Microsoft project or you know whatever whatever means somebody would, would suggest so Basically, what you start out doing is coordinating your asset management and capital improvement plans. As we've discussed, once you evaluate your assets, that feeds your capital improvement plan and you know, helping you to determine which projects should be done, when they can be done. Um, you just lay those out over a period of time and your, and your time period can be adjusted to, to you know, basically your, uh, your comfort level. We would suggest probably at least three to five to maybe even 10 years. We know a lot of things can change in 10 years as we have seen this year, but however, you, you can plug milestones into those plans uh, when, you, when you know or anticipate things to be occurring. You go back to some of the uh, regulatory deadlines we, you know, we mentioned before, uh, whether it be MS4 or a consent order uh, requirement where there are projects that will have to be completed 
you know there's a deadline out there. Well, don't wait till the last year if you can help it. Start planning for that at the beginning of your plan of either your permit period or your planning period or, or whatever time frame you're in, so that you're not up against the end where it's very possible that uh, you know materials and or contractor resources will be in short supply and in very much very high demand. So along with that, your costs are going to go up on the future. Just a semi-editorial comment. Um, reviewing upcoming monetary needs against the projected revenues. That's everything we've been talking about. Um, do you have a reserve fund? Can you build one up for both the emergencies and or future projects and potentially allow projects to be bundled together to uh, facilitate financing and funding decisions as well as economies of scale? Uh, certainly have, um, I would extend this to even excuse me, uh, multiple entity projects, if you can pull that off, start having discussions with, you know, potentially a municipal neighbor for a project along your border. Uh, grant funders love multiple municipal projects, another editorial comment. But it, it allows you to, once again, group the project and plan for them in the most uh, cost effective manner. So once again, how do I start? Well, you start with what you know. Um, Review how have you been doing it so far. A lot of a lot of us have been just doing year-to-year -year budgeting, planning, and budgeting. That's okay, uh, and, and that's been okay. That that has served everybody well for a long time. However, it does not necessarily lend itself to you know looking farther down the line and doing the types of planning that we're talking about today. You know, a lot of the project uh, uh, planning and budgeting is what did we do last year? Okay, always good to look at. You have to keep obviously track of your records, your costs. Um, go, I always tend to go back to Rose, but where did we pave last year? But take that type of activity and, and once again, expand, expand your thought process. Think out of the box. Okay, well, what did we do last year? Not only what we, what we want to do this year, but look at the next number of roads uh, and go through an evaluation uh, and a rating exercise has been discussed before. Look at your current records. They may be all on paper. You may have a road book, you may have a sewer book, you may have laminated 11 by 17 sewer maps, or uh, you may have had the opportunity to upgrade to elect finals or files or even a GIS system. Um, but there are still a lot of places out there that a lot of the information resides in the existing employees, heads. What if Ed retires? Uh, and I just picked Ed as a name. However, the point is, um, it's important to develop the records and develop the information, uh, uh, both paper and get the information out of your existing employees um, and other folks that would know the history uh, to make sure that gets uh, included in your planning. We talked about uh, before about bringing people together that may, may not have had these discussions before. And uh, some of the questions you should be asking among yourselves. Who in your organization has the information or the records or the resources to help you with this effort? Goes back to get Ed before he retires. What format are they in? Can we, can we uh, um, have access to that? Or if they're all in an old road book somewhere, can we get somebody scanning those so we keep that knowledge? There are easy ways to save old information. It takes a little bit of time, but allows you uh, the ability to not be another five years down the line and say, oh my gosh, the, the book is gone. Another question, does your planning budgeting process extend into the next five to 10 years? A lot of times it hasn't, sometimes it has, but should be a more frequent discussion as you go into the planning and budgeting process every year. Do your revenues adequately support, provide support for the full life cycle? And, and uh, Ben touched on this before as well. It, it's important to plan for the full life cycle cost of whatever uh, asset you're discussing, whether it be a truck, a roadway, a, a, a treatment system, um, it's only supposed to last a certain amount of time. You may have to replace it and or re uh, rebuild it at the end of that time. But there are costs every year for most systems. There are costs every year with a park to, to properly maintain it. There are costs every year with a sewer system to maintain it. You want to make sure you're taking in, into account, even if it's, just, if it's just estimates, if you don't have the records so far, you know what, we've probably been spending however much on sewer uh, maintenance for the last couple of years. Put that in and, and allow that to uh, move forward with the plan. Once again, add your community leaders, get them engaged so that they know uh, for their own benefit or and for uh, information, getting information out to their constituents, getting out to the public, 
uh, having appropriate uh, discussions at meetings. Um, get the word out so they can help you and actually hopefully become a champion for uh, sustaining your infrastructure. Then as a result of all of that, come up with the uh, most appropriate method or to start with the, the method that's most comfortable with you at this point, some of which are gonna follow. This may be a page out of your, out of your road book. And no, <laughs> we're not gonna read through this, but here is a sample inventory that uh, a community has done of their roadways, um, what type they are, what rating they're currently giving them, uh, comments about the roads, and finally over at the end, when was the last time it was, it was repaved, if, if ever within the limits of this report. But based on the information that uh, most communities have, it, this will take some time, but should not be a, a difficult task to at least compile your roads and uh, look through the records to see the last time they were paved. That starts the planning process. Once you do that, once again, for roads, you can take it one step further and at least in terms of today's dollars, start planning out what you might need to do. What would be your plan? What if we, if we tackle each one of those roads to, uh, to the level that we're discussing, what's that going to cost? And, and you can develop a spreadsheet like this based on your own needs, based on your own information in not too difficult a fashion and work your way across until you get to the overall, excuse me, a uh, life cycle and or repair and or replacement of that specific roadway and or asset. We're gonna show you different assets here in a second, but, but typically uh, this is something you can do in-house. You can get some help if you need to, but uh, this helps the calculation. And then this becomes your record uh, for moving forward. Here's a spreadsheet that <clears throat> took it a little bit farther with, with water and sewer assets. Once again, not gonna try to read the whole thing, but this is one where um, assets are named, their installation year is on there, their original cost, the uh, projected life, and you're working your way across the uh, spreadsheet with priorities and what happens if it fails and you know what's the critical nature of each of these assets. And then you can sign different um, uh, interest rates and or escalation costs in that last column. So that um, if you look at the numbers that you can see, cost of renewal replacement, the current value may be 1.2 million. Well, whatever time period this spreadsheet's looking at, we may be looking at more 1.7, 1.8, even closer to 2 million. So um, exercise like this is an essential part of the capital improvement planning process. Now, if you um, <clears throat> have electronic records or if you have a GIS system or if you have the uh, abil ability to develop a GIS system, we have found that these can really facilitate the planning process because unlike um, a lot of people think of GIS systems as, as making pretty maps and yes, they can, but they can also store a lot of data about all of your, about all of your assets <clears throat> Basically, the, the information that we were looking at in the last two spreadsheets can be included in your GIS system depending on the assets so that it's clickable and findable and reportable um, and organizable, which, which is the key. You can put in utility locations, records. You can update them real time. Uh, you can put in your maintenance capital planning so that you can actually look visually. This also helps with meetings uh, that you, you can have a visual aspect to here's our capital improvement plan. Here's how we think and the different parts of the community that we think it, we're going to work in. Provides a great means to uh, store your data, uh, allows um, data sharing amongst the community and um, amongst everybody that needs to know. Um, and it really helps you with your, uh, as I said, record keeping and regulatory, or <laughs> it's becoming at the end of the hour, isn't it? The regulatory reporting, uh, because you can pull the data out of these systems. Um, very easily to compile your annual reports to the different regulatory agencies. And basically capital improvement planning can make, it can help and can make projects happen. Because everything we've discussed in the last hour, we, we talk about the magnitude of the improvements. Uh, you can have those discussions with your community leaders so they understand what's going on. You kind of reduce your unknowns. Uh, it helps them and you inform the revenue decisions 
it allows for a, an easier budgeting process because the plan is already in place. Uh, it allows you to prioritize and, and maybe bundle projects for construction and the best cost effective uh, financing. And funding can be strategically secured and, secured and leveraged. Once again, uh, working your way out over time. And eventually it is our opinion that it will eventually pay for itself. Bringing it full circle, all of these inputs, including the capital improvement plan will, do, will uh, help you with your funding strategy development. And they're all important. Um, but until you sit down and actually go through the process, and it may be, it may be different at some uh, cases than you have done before, this type of input from all um, uh, circles of the globe, if, if you will, um, helps pr produce a quality and useful capital improvement plan because you don't want this to be one of the plans that sit on the shelf. Now it's your turn. Yeah, I think, um, Kara, I don't know, did we get any questions that came in? Um, no, not at the moment. Uh, any of the questions are related to whether or not the presentation or the slide decks uh, will be available uh, to look at at a later time, and they will be. This webinar was recorded, and uh, we will provide a PDF of the PowerPoint presentation as well as a link to the recording um, within one or two days. That will also be available on the SPC website. All right, guys, it doesn't look like we have any questions. If you want to go ahead and conclude again, we want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, thanks to the SPC for hosting us this afternoon. Um, and if you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out to either Ben or Rob um, and look for the recording and the PDF PowerPoint to be available uh, within the next few days. Um, so thank you all again. And with that, we will uh, hopefully see you all soon. Have a good long, short week, everybody. <laughs>